Now we saw in the last section of the lecture about how a powerful colony of Egypt was able to get its independence fairly early. In this section, we're going to take a look at some other countries in Northeast Africa, particularly a lot of Italian colonies in Africa, and how their path to independence unfolded in large part due to World War II. And then towards the end of this part of the lecture, we'll take a look at another adventure in France trying to maintain its colonies. Ethiopia is kind of a different case. Ethiopia had been accepted as a member of the League of Nations after the Great War. But in 1935 and 1936, of course, the fascist aggression from Italy led to its conquest. During 1940-1941, a campaign against the Italians in Ethiopia was a war of liberation, ending with the restoration of Emperor Haile Selassie in May of 1941, therefore regaining its independence. Nearby Ethiopia was Eritrea, which the Italians also conquered. Following Italy's defeat in the war, the Allied powers forced Italy to give up all title to any of their African colonies. Eritrea presented a different case for independence. The main allies, the US, Britain, France, and the USSR, agreed that if they could not solve Eritrea's future, they would pass the problem on to the United Nations. Now, why would Eritrea be problematic? Well, part of its geography, and part of its history, and part of its economics. Eritrea was sandwiched between Sudan, which at that time was part of Egypt, and Ethiopia, which had once claimed Eritrea as its own territory. Economically, the Allies didn't feel it was strong enough to stand on its own two feet. Thus, they passed the question on to the United Nations, and that's where the US tipped the balance. Again, the Cold War played a part here. Ethiopia had consistently supported Western initiatives in East Africa, and the US wanted to reward that loyalty out of fear that they might turn communist. In 1950, the UN chose to make Eritrea sort of an independent but dependent nation. Ethiopia would have control over it, although Eritreans would choose a parliament and a leader. Eritrea would also have its own defense, foreign affairs, and trade relations with other countries separate from Ethiopia. Now on paper that might sound acceptable, but this was not the most welcome option. The Eritrean population was divided almost equally between Muslims and Christians, and the proposal for being under a Christian imperial regime in Ethiopia was not what the Muslim population wanted to hear. Even the Christian population was not keen on Emperor Haile Selassie. In 1952, Eritrea became a federated province of Ethiopia, but within a decade, an independence movement called the Eritrean Liberation Front sought to break Eritrea from Ethiopian control. However, Ethiopia dissolved the federation and annexed them instead, which led to a near 30-year war for Eritrean independence from Ethiopia. While Eritrea was eventually successful, gaining independence in 1991, the war resulted in the loss of direct access to the Red Sea and, of course, made trade more difficult. Now, we're not going to get that involved for every country, but in researching this lecture, the Eritrea situation sort of led me down a rabbit hole. Be glad I'm skipping over a lot of things. And while we're in the neighborhood, after World War II, Britain and Italy split control in Somaliland, and Somalians proved rebellious against both of these European countries. In Somalia's case, the United Nations gave Italy a 10-year hold on its part of Somalia to prepare it for independence, while Britain embarked on a similar program in her Somalian protectorate. In 1960, the two territories merged together into an independent Somali republic. And moving on to another former Italian colony, in 1912, when Italy defeated the Ottoman Empire in a minor war, they took Libya as the spoils of war. Libya as we know, has massive amounts of oil, but the Italians didn't yet know that. And in fact, oil wouldn't be discovered there for a while. But following the defeat of Italy in World War II, again, Libya fell under British and French control until 1947, when Italy was forced basically to relinquish their claims. In 1949, the United Nations General Assembly passed a resolution in support of Libyan independence. In 1950, the people of Libya elected a king, and the next year, 1951, Libya became an independent kingdom. The discovery of oil reserves in 1959 and the subsequent income from petroleum sales enabled Libya to go from being one of the poorest nations to one of the wealthiest. However, just because Libya was independent didn't mean it was stable. Muammar Gaddafi's coup in 1969 led Libya down a different path, but that's another story for another day. Perhaps surprisingly, Italy and Libya maintained diplomatic relations, although when Gaddafi took over Libya in 1969, he expelled all Italians living there. In 2008, Italy and Libya signed a treaty for economic and civic cooperation. 
At the signing ceremony of the document, Italian Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi recognized historic atrocities and repression committed by the state of Italy against the Libyan people during the colonial rule, stating, quote, In this historic document, Italy apologizes for its killing, destruction, and repression of the Libyan people during the period of colonial rule, and went on to say that this was, quote, a complete and moral acknowledgement of the damage inflicted on Libya by Italy during the colonial era, end quote. Within a few years after the end of the Second World War, therefore, the whole Northeast Africa, from Libya to Somalia, had secured independence from foreign rule. This did not mean, of course, that its problems were at an end. However, the destruction of the Italian Empire and the early British acceptance of the independence of Egypt, the Sudan, and Somaliland meant that the prospect of achieving indigenous governments free from European control happened earlier in Northeast Africa than most of the rest of the continent. Maybe the most exciting independence movement was in Algeria. In 1954, nationalists were in open revolt throughout northern Africa. The French quickly appreciated that the most serious danger to their empire was in Algeria. This was where the French had the heaviest investment and had the most to lose. It was also where the local society suffered the most severely under the French presence. The modernization of the economy by French settlement as well as French capital meant that foreigners held most of the best lands and the best jobs. Native Algerians were converted into a depressed and frustrated proletariat. France, which had just lost Indochina, was determined not to lose the next anti-colonial war, particularly not in its oldest and nearest major colony, which was regarded as an integral part of the republic. In the early morning hours of November 1, 1954, the FLN, the National Liberation Front guerrillas, attacked military and civilian targets throughout Algeria in what became known as the Toussaint Rouge. From Cairo, the FLN broadcast a proclamation calling on Muslims in Algeria to join in a national struggle for, quote, the restoration of the Algerian state, sovereign, democratic, and social, within the framework of the principles of Islam. The uprising could count on the support of Arab nationalists throughout the Muslim world, and there was hardly a single Algerian who would oppose it. This began the Algerian War for Independence. The war was incredibly bloody, involving torture and around 150,000 Algerian deaths. Many who did not die lost their homes. The French were willing to fight hard to keep their colony. In fact, the French deployed 500,000 soldiers to the Algerian countryside, confident that they would hold Algeria for the French. But Frenchmen in France itself had become increasingly critical of the cost of the war in men and money, and also of the methods being used to wage it, so that the army officers and settlers in Algeria began to doubt whether the Fourth Republic had the will to maintain the war. They began a revolt of their own. Charles de Gaulle came back into power and instituted a Fifth Republic, which had a stronger executive. And Charles de Gaulle had concluded that France's economy and society could hardly survive the strain of maintaining a presence in Algeria. Eventually, in 1962, it came to a vote, and it really wasn't much of a contest. Almost all of the French settlers left, and Algerians now had the chance to rebuild their country in their own way. All right, we've come pretty far in this lecture, so I'm going to put a pin on northern Africa, and then we'll turn towards West Africa and see how independence unfolded in a different way. Stay tuned. Thank you.